Okay, so we're going to get started. Uh, we're starting a little late. Um, so first of all, thank all of you for coming. And uh, those of you who don't know me, you're out of luck. <laughs> it's impossible. Yeah. My name is John Paul. I'm the director of the Haas Institute. And in my family, I'm known as six of nine, because there are nine kids and I'm number six. Uh, so, um, uh, and I'm going to today we're talking about uh, Gordon Whitman's uh, new book, Stand Up. Mm -hmm. And those of you who don't know Gordon, you're really out of luck. But you, uh, probably you know him, you wouldn't be here. Um, I've known Gordon for years uh, as a um, uh, head of, uh, I guess, research and activity at PICO. And I've worked with Pico for many years and worked with Gordon for many years and learned a lot um, and shared a lot. And I think um, we're better, meaning uh, the researchers and us, because of Pico, and hopefully we've offered something there. But more importantly, um, whatever we do here in the university and the research institute, we don't have, as they say, I hate the expression boots on the ground because it's too militaristic. Um, but, I, but we do need people who are actually engaged in community and uh, that's Pico. And also, Pico's gone through a lot of transformation. Um, you know, sort of start off, I think, with a very, fairly uh, orthodox, narrow focus. Um, and I'll talk about this in a minute, because I think it, um, and then they broke out of that. Really sort of stretching, um, having new alliances, having a new foundation, thinking more about, um, Spirituality, more about faith, which shows up in the book. Because it's interesting, because PICO is a faith-based organization, and like a lot of them, PICO, Camellia, um, uh, Industrial Area Foundation, they all come out of that tradition. Uh, but it's not central, I think, in terms of their practice. Um, and so the organizers are, not from my perspective, deeply, an deeply animated by faith. And I think um, my sense of Gordon and the work of PICO in the last 10 years is that it's moved more into that direction. Uh, and it shows up some in the book in some interesting ways. Um, so I'm just gonna make a few comments and then uh, have a conversation with Gordon and then uh, hopefully at the end I invite you into the conversation as well. I have a bunch of notes, most of which I'm gonna ignore. Um, uh, but um, one of the things, uh, when I was reading the book, and this is my second time reading it, uh, we had an early draft of it um, and didn't spread it, reread it again. Um, those of you know, Gordon talks about these conversations and he takes us through, I think, the five conversations uh, that are necessary for uh, organizing and building power and face-to-face uh, -face and getting in touch with your emotions. Um, and I must say, they're the overall gestalt of the book and what he's doing and what I think about the audience I think it's a must read and it's completely powerful. On the other hand, I think it in some ways still hems a little bit too close to what I would think of as the Alinsky model. Uh, I think there's some tensions in there. Uh, so for example, I'll give you one of the tensions. It's one, the um, sort of intentionality of uh, both the conversation and figuring out what your purpose is. And then when he talks about emotions and gets a little bit into the mind science and sort of acknowledging that we actually don't have complete access to who we are. Uh, that who we are is not immediately available to us. And he talks about that more explicitly when he talks about our experience. He talks about our experience being mediated through stories, uh, which I think is quite right and quite powerful and somewhat counterintuitive. Because a lot of times we talk about our experience as if they're immediate, and that's the foundation of everything we do. So there's a nice tension there, and it's not resolved completely in the book. I was glad to see it there. Um, and I think that it, that plays out in a number of different ways. Uh, another tension I saw, uh, again, I thought the sort of grounding in contextual history, uh, the uh, chapter on inequality, was really wonderful. And, uh, um, and especially because Americans, including you know, organized in the left, is incredibly ahistoric. So we actually don't know about uh, the GI Bill. We don't know about redlining. We don't know about uh, these patterns, these structures. And I thought you did a really nice job of laying those out. Um, uh, and and I think Gordon, from my perspective, avoided a classical mistake on the white left, that is of uh, privileging class over race. 
uh, but he slips a little bit. Uh, because you, you talk a little bit about how uh, economic divide actually pushes into uh, racial fragmentation, which is true often, but not always. It, it actually moves in both directions. There's a lot of literature suggesting that it is sometimes the divide of race or ethnicity that actually causes uh, economic divide. So it doesn't move in a single direction. Uh, and you can respond to all these things when I, I, I give you um, the floor. Um, uh, the other thing I felt is that um, the book, in some ways, privileged not only organizing but a certain kind of organizing. Um, so I, when I was reading the book again, I was thinking about, well, there actually is a revolution going on in the country right now. It's called Trump, and Trump had a different model. Uh, he didn't do one-on-ones. Uh, he didn't do base building uh, in the way that you describe in the book. Um, and in some ways, I think what he did is he he. Uh, there's a book by. Um, Karen Stenner, uh, that I recommend to you, called Authoritarian Dynamic. And her assertion is that a third of people across the globe are latent authoritarian. Uh, and it's latent, and it becomes active, interacting with our environment, and to use Gordon's term, being primed. Uh, and then it explodes. And so she says it's easy to activate and easy to deactivate. But it's not activated necessarily on one-on-ones. There's a whole other process in which that can be activated and deactivated. So when I, one of the things I was thinking about is that the model for me is incredibly powerful, but it's a model, not the model. Uh, and so I would like to, to, to and, and either today or at some point, talk to Gordon more about what some other models are and how we learn from them. And then the last thing I would say is that, um, well, two things. One, the incompleteness in uh, of the organizing movement uh, in the sense that we've had a lot of victories and, and Gordon talks to us about the miners and about Fannie Lou Hamer and SNCC and so we, but they're all incomplete. I would even say radically incomplete. incomplete. Um, and I think in the book, it's where I'm reading it at least, you're calling for something more radical. And you're calling for uh, not just a deeper movement, you're calling for what I would call an ontological movement calling for a new self, a new we. Uh, and in that new we, I think we have to situate whiteness in a very critical role. Not white people, but whiteness. Um, and um, I think there's a phrase you use which you basically say, um, as long as there's inequality and a sense of scarcity, there will be fights around these different categories of whiteness and others. I, would, I think that's right, although I would frame it differently. I would say the very concept of whiteness and dominance already has it cooked into it, inequality. That, that's a, that flows naturally from inequality. And, uh, and Heather McGee, I think, I think uh, is one of your supporters in the book, talks about if you have a position of uh, privilege, unearned or not, then equality seems like an attack. Um, and so there are these tensions that are quite deep that you sort of suggest in the book, uh, but, and I was thinking, you know, along the book, uh, but you don't uh, fully develop. Um, and then the last thing, and then I will turn over to Gordon, um, I really appreciated the personal stories and, um, you know, uh, the story about his son, uh, the story about his own growth and path, I think it made the book uh, come alive. Um, and, um, and I think there are lessons in it for all of us, even those of us who don't live our life day to day uh, being organizers. So let me stop there and have you come and we'll have a conversation back and forth. Great. Um, hi everyone, how are you doing? It's just, it's great to be with John. Um, we've been in dialogue for years, as John said, and um, his imprint on both me and the book, and on Pico, which is soon to be faith and action, speaking to your point about embracing faith and spirituality. Um, I'm also, I just want to recognize John Bauman, Father John Bauman, who founded Pico, soon to be faith and action, 45 years ago, and works out of Oakland, and started in Oakland, so it's, it's great to have you here, John. Um, so 
I, and I think this starting place just in responding is I, I do feel like we are in um, uh, a struggle. It's almost like a race against time that I think humanity is getting better. I think there is something happening around, kind of, and I, I look at my own kids and their friends and um, just sort of what's moving in the sort of the spirit. I, I think there is a, a greater sense of connectedness of um, you know, in some ways, climate change, I think, you know, brings it to a, like a really sharp point that we're in this, we're in this very small little planet spinning through the universe. <laughs> and the idea that we're sort of on our own, individually responsible for somehow creating good lives or creating a better um, world just makes less and less sense. So I think there is a sense that uh, I feel like we're, we are getting better at the same time that we're facing, again, facing up against a set of vicious cycles that um, are driving our politics and, and, and inequality, climate change, migration, racial anxiety. So I, I, I think I, mostly I'm trying to write into that tension. Um, and I, I, when I wrote the book, I had this idea, and I've been arguing with people in the publishing business from the beginning, that I kind of wanted the book to be in the self-help section. <laughs> my, like my, I don't know about your bookstores, but where I live in Arlington, Virginia, in my Barnes & Noble, there's like a quarter of a shelf that says Current Affairs. And it's got Rules for Radicals by Saul Linsky, who's not mentioned in the book at all anywhere, by the way. Um, well, but it's yeah. obviously the tradition is, 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 is you know, certainly you know, in there. Um, and then there's like a wall of living your best life. <laughs> and I was really interested in um, not writing for an intellectual audience, but really writing to the end of action, of engagement. And, and, and my sense is, from my work as an organizer and just being alive right now, that there's so many people out there who are frustrated and angry about what's happening. They see it on their Facebook feed, they see it in their own lives, they're experiencing it personally, whether it's, I, I'm worried that my, my child can't go to college or afford college, or I don't, um, I'm afraid that a family member is gonna be deported, or um, I, I have a criminal record, a third of Americans have a criminal record, and there's so many barriers to getting work and finding housing. So personal, and then in the media, um, and what we see in our friends and community, but aren't quite sure what they can do about it. And John, you said, and it's really, it's really stuck with me a lot, that um, you know, most people, something like 90% of people, think there's too much money in our political system and that it's corrupted the political system. The problem is most of them don't think anything can be done about it. So do we spend our time trying to persuade the last 10% of people that there's too much money in our politics, or do we figure out how we can begin to do something about it, and you look at what's happened in Seattle and Portland, where you had local ballot measures, because it's really hard to change the political rules through the political system, ballot measures that passed, that created school, um, finance systems that give people vouchers. So if you live in Seattle, you get a 25, four $25 vouchers, and if you're running for office, you can um, aggregate those if you participate in the system, and it really goes from a system where you know, you a tiny number of people are financing campaigns to here's another way you can participate beyond voting. So, you know, it takes a long time, but I mean, that's the sort of vision of we've got to start there, and it's sort of the history of American politics that we have a constitution written um, in so many different ways by primarily white male slave owners to keep the status quo in place, and we're still living with that constitution that we revere, um, but makes change very difficult in Washington. So we complain about Congress, but it's a long history of complaining about Congress being an enemy that doesn't do um, much, but it's designed that way. So the sort of history of starting local um, really matters, but people have to believe not only that change is possible, in a society that's built, just so built, on individualism and you can't fight city halls. So even in our own organizations, even people who think they're progressive, I think we still kind of inter assimilate this notion that we're pretty much on our own. Um, 
I, I talk about the book that I, I, one of my formative political experiences was living in Chile in 1990 at the very end of the Pinochet um, dictatorship. And, you know, one thing going to meetings where you realize that, you, you know, people were, it's life and death, right? So that was very, that was helpful to sort of think about what politics means um, and that you had to trust people. But the level of political consciousness <laughs> was incredible and you know, formed over generations of political parties and, and organizing that prepared people to be political. And I think one of the biggest challenges we have right now is not being political enough as a society. So we're facing this incredibly um, just well-organized and scary and um, attack on democracy and attack on basic rights. And you've got um, leaders, of, leaders of the immigrant rights movement in this country who are being detained and deported solely because of their political beliefs as a, you know, just one tip of the iceberg of like what happens when you speak out um, and get involved in change. So we're facing a very serious political moment um, with a society that's fairly depoliticized. So the mass quest question of how you do this on scale is I think a big question. Um, the organizing tradition I come out of um, has faith-based organizing, usually it's how it's identified um, and organizing more broadly, what attracted me to it, I was on my way, I went to law school, and I was on my way to being a lawyer for community organizations. That's what I thought I would do. And then I went to Chile, and I saw a social movement. And I thought, oh, what is that in this country? How many people have, have, been, have lived outside of, this, of the United States and experienced a level of social movement activity or um, sort of a different kind of politics than our political expectations. And it shapes how you look at the world. So I came back, what is, where do you find that in the United States? And the closest thing I could find was, so, was faith-based community organizing, but as I was taught it, it was a tradition that said, do multiracial work, but don't talk about race, or too much about race because you'll make it harder to bring people together. In fact, I think it made it much harder to actually build trust. And then you just, if you're not fighting both race, you know, we were doing this uh, big campaign in, in, in Pennsylvania to create a fair funding formula for the state. It's one of four states that doesn't have any school funding formula. So the politicians just decide where the money goes. And there's a whole infrastructure built to create equity across school districts. That, that campaign never did a racial analysis of what would happen if you eliminated the economic disparities. And our organization power, which has built into it a racial consciousness and an understanding of whatever issue we're gonna work on, we're both working to expand the pie, create opportunity, but also close racial um, disparities, said, well, why don't we look at, in addition to economic differences, what about race? And even if you eliminate all the economic differences, there's still uh, a, a curve based on the percentage of African American students in the, in, the, in the school district and how much money they get from the state. So um, building, but that was not how I was brought up in organizing. We also um, had a tradition of pretty much focused on self-interest. I think with John has worked with us, and I, I want this is a little aside that I think if anybody is in the, the sort of university world asking how do you make a difference, um, I think John is such a great example of the ability to do it all at some level, not everything, but to both be deeply embedded in social movement organizations. And I see people who know John, um, just not, you know, I'm going to go speak somewhere or um, do research with a group, but like a lifetime commitment to walking with organizations. John's investment in PICO, Faith in Action, the larger movement, um, just is, you know, people can send something, you know, that, that we're working on like a, um, a, a statement. John, can you take a look at this and see if, you, if we could word it differently so we're really not reinforcing bad narratives? So that level of commitment to being in solidarity with and in partnership with a movement um, 
and both give to and receive from. So tremendous, um, I think, role model of what it means to be a public intellectual. And one of the things John's worked with us on is, well, self-interest is important. Organizing is really based on it. That we, we just, people, if we're going to build movements that people are part of, they need to see themselves in it. It needs to, uh, what I think about PICO is there, or faith in action, that um, we're successful if people can say, my involvement made a difference in my life. So my participation in this organization, open community organizations, or uh, Pico, California, or Isaiah in Minnesota, I can see something better in my life as a result. Might have helped someone else, but I can identify something in my own life that's better. And I look at myself and the world differently. And if we can hit that sweet spot, then we're really adding some value. And we can be involved in lots of things that make life better for other people. We can be involved in things perhaps that are better for ourselves, but are they transformative? So we're trying to create experiences that really transform people. So self-interest is important, but as we've, you know, and I've been baked, this has been baked into me over the last decade, largely, you know, in large part, or helped by John, that, you know, we're really motivated by our, emo our emotions, by our search for purpose and meaning, connection, and I think we've become much more expansive about the kind of organizations we build, what we do in rooms together. Uh, we really should be doing some organizing in this room. We sort of, <laughs> we sort of started out without doing it. Um, but we're really trying to create emotional spaces where people feel valued, and their voices matter, and their stories matter, and that that's the foundation um, and building more humane organizations. And the question is, can you do that at scale? And I think that's where we have not answered. To, can, you build, can you build social movements that are people-centered at scale, that are large enough to go up against the Amazons and the um, other you know, multinational global institutions that really are increasingly running our politics? And I don't think we've really answered that question. But I was really trying to write a book that was less about um, a set of ideas and more about a, a, way, a set of practice, but embedded in it is a, is a theory that says that you know, people don't learn politics um, and become politically conscious because somebody tells them about what's wrong in the world. People don't feel powerful because somebody tells them they're powerful. It's through experience embedded in meaningful activity with other people that people rethink how the world works and become political that our organizations need to be racially conscious. They can't um, segregate that work of, this organization does anti-racism work, this organization works to raise wages. But we've got to see those as, as interconnected fights. And it's helpful to sort of think about, I think as much as we head there, we're still, the, the, the segregation of the activity is so deeply embedded in American society and in our social movements that it still lives on. Like you feel like you kill it and it comes back up. Um, <laughs> And that these organizations need to be more humane. They just, they, the tradition, the Linsky tradition, the tradition of treating people as ends and not means, of um, experiencing somebody somewhere saying, I organized an event, I need you to come to it. Or would you sign a petition? Would you, that, that I, I'm reading, rereading, um, how many people have read um, No Shortcuts by Jane McAlevey? Okay, so this is a book to read. So after you read Stand Up, this is, there's one book. Really, if there's, if there's one book that I'd read um, next to it would be Jane's book, No Shortcuts, and it's it's really a, just a deep, deep critique of the labor movement. And like the, as much as labor movement is suffering from external attacks, that the abandonment of organizing, of working with workers to to build their capacity to go on strike and withdraw their labor. Is, is like a lost art in the labor movement. And there's lots of shortcuts and lots of things you can do, but fundamentally, people's capacity to live a decent life and negotiate at their workplace depends on their ability to successfully, collectively withdraw their labor. And she's got some great, kind of very practical stories about how organizing can happen in a way that people build that capacity to um, use their labor and negotiate what they need. And one of the things she says about community organizers is you can never say thank you at the end of a visit. So an organizer visits a worker in, at their home and is trying to challenge them to become part of a, a union organizing campaign that 
they, the, the good locals train their organizers, you may never say thank you because you don't want to create the union as a third party to the negotiation, which is what most workers experience, that I have, a, I have an employer and I have a union and then there's me. And really, it's, there's an employer and then there's a union and I am the union. Um, so that's sort of the spirit we're trying to teach, but doing that at scale, um, and he, he, the last thing I'll say is that you know, part of our challenge is that even, um, even among organizers, so Hari Han, who's a colleague, deeply influential in this, in my thinking, um, did research among labor organizers, and a fraction of the time that labor organizers are spending um, during the week is with workers. And we probably, I don't know the number, we might have 50,000 people who are paid to advance social justice in this country. And the question I was asked is how many of them are talking to people who aren't also being paid? So we've really professionalized the sector, but we haven't really built a movement. So I have a lot of fun, it's like quantity over quality in some ways that we really need, a ma we need to democratize political activity and make it much more part of normal life. Um, as much as anything, and that's really part of the spirit of the book, and why I'm excited that it, I, we, we put it on Spanish too, so that um, it's really sort of trying to get it out there into the world. So, great. There's my response to that. I don't think I answered every challenge. But. Yeah, I have one more round, and then we'll have okay. a respond, and we'll open it up to you. But I was um, a couple of things. I was very first. I was rereading the book, and I will read it again, <laughs> at least a third time, maybe a fourth time. But um, um, at one point, I was feeling like the organizing in the book was organized for outsiders. So it was, uh, in that sense, it was talking about, uh, um, it was interesting to me because it was like powers that be, like city managers or heads of banks, which I don't think is really very powerful. Uh, you know, I think they're transactional. Uh, you know, if you know anything about banks, banks are actually being driven by hedge funds. They don't actually make decisions themselves. Um, and no one meets with hedge funds. Um, so, it, so even the, in the sense, the one-on-one -on -one meetings with people with power, I felt like those aren't people with power. They're actually, but anyway. And so, and you talk, and so at the end of the book, you get to this because, like, well, who make the rules? Uh, and most organizing, again, you do get to it at the end of the book. I probably would have put it a little earlier. Um, is actually changing the rules. You talk about a chess game and changing the environment, uh, and, and we're seeing that now but a deliberate strategy to change the rules. Not the strategy to win by the rules, but to actually change the rules. And that's to me, is much more transformational. Uh, so I'd like you to comment on that. Another, I'm, next week I'm going to Oregon. And some of you may know, uh, Derek Bell was the dean of, uh, he was the dean at Oregon, uh, and he got canned essentially, um, because he pushed too hard for bringing black faculty to the University of Oregon and Eugene. And it's interesting, an interesting story. Derek was a good friend of mine, and although we didn't agree on everything, I'll come back to that in a minute. But he was being considered, he's being vetted for a MacArthur uh, Genius Award, and everything is secret, you know, he's like, they swear you to confidentiality. And so they called me about Derek, and they said, you know, he's done all these incredible things, but when we talked to people at Oregon, they said, uh, you know, he was kind of a, you know, he, he fought them too hard, and, and I said, yeah, that's not the issue. What was he fighting for? He was fighting to bring more people of color and women there, and that he lost that fight. But now he's being penalized 10 years later. Like, he came here and caused trouble. And so I'm going up to Oregon, and they're still fighting that same fight. But one of the things that I, I'm on record for disagreeing or challenging Derek about is he talked about interest conversion. That's one of his things that he left with critical race theory. And the problem with interest conversion, from my perspective, as Derek talked about, to some extent I organized and talked about it, uh, that uh, Gordon has already prefigured, is that interest is seen as given. And interest is actually situational. Our interests actually change. You change a person's situation, you change their interests. And give you a concrete example. Think of uh, the work around um, uh, janitors in Los Angeles. And what the union finally figured out is that if they brought undocumented workers into the union, the union no longer opposed undocumented workers. So on one hand, it's like you're now analyzing this, but you're analyzing it on a set of conditions. You change those conditions, and your interests actually change. So interest is actually not that stable. Uh, and, uh, and again, I was I, glad to see in the book, just sort of suggested the multi-facet 
nature of who we are. We're not stable people. And to some extent, that's an incred incredibly radical thing that if we could hold on to it, I think it moves us in some interesting ways. Um, uh, two more things, two more other points. Uh, one is, um, when I was reading the book, and I don't know exactly why, but it, I, death came up a lot. And to, to paraphrase Mark Twain and Reverend Dr. King, they both say something like, if you don't know what you're living for or why to live, uh, if you don't have any reason, if you don't know what you'll die for, you have nothing to live for. Um, and somehow that just, for some reason, the book reminded me of that. I don't know why exactly. Um, uh, but so I think there's these, these deep tributaries in the book that actually radically change the way we think about organizing. Um, and, um, you know, uh, one of my favorite writers, Robert Unger, he says, a good life, you only have to die once. Uh, I mean, we all have to die, but we don't have to die every two days. Uh, and so uh, part of dying once is having something to live for and being in deep relationship, uh, being part of something. Uh, you know, um, those of you who heard me heard me talk about my dad many times. My dad is 97 years old, and he's been ready to die for years. Uh, and we have a deeply connected, interconnected family. And about 12 years ago, my my dad was diagnosed with this um, life-threatening tumor. And he called the family together because we make decisions collectively. Uh, and he said, I'm not going to do anything. You know, I'm, at, this, at this point, I'm 85 years old. Uh, my wife has passed. All the kids have grown. I'm ready to go. And, uh, and you know, just announcing it, but you know, also generally asking for permission. By the way, five years earlier, he had a similar episode, and he was in a hospital, and he said at that time to my mother, you know, this, this is too painful, this operation is too much, you know, all the kids are grown, ready to go, and my mother said no. She, he, asked, he asked for permission to go, and she said no. She said, and she, she said, and this, Lord, see, this is so painful, I can't stand it. She said, stop being a big baby. You ain't going nowhere. <laughs> but this time, we didn't have that kind of cachet as my mother, so we couldn't say that. But what I did is I did some research and found out that what the tumor he had could actually explode and not kill him, but completely incapacitate him and leave him in deep pain. So he, he said, okay, I'll have the tumor removed. Uh, but the point is, is that it was a collective decision. For him, there was no reason to stay here. His life was complete. And he believed, he's, he's a Christian minister, he believed that God keeps us here for a purpose. And I said, okay, Dad, you're 86, 87 at that point. Uh, what do you think God's keeping you for? And he said, I think I'm here now to teach the kids how to care for other people. Uh, but his whole life is, uh, and I think, I'd like to think my life too is about that deep connections with others. And so the, the, this, both the spiritual grounding, whether it's relationship to, to God or to others or community. Uh, and, and, I, and I think being deeply connected in my family, a larger community, the fear of death is largely not present. I mean, this thing is completely gone. Uh, and um, the last story on this, my, my daughter had a daughter, so I have a granddaughter. And my daughter is very close, and people accuse her of being, a, you know, um, you know a father's daughter. Um, but uh, when my granddaughter was born, I told my daughter, I said, I feel like the circle is complete. You know, I'm not trying to leave here, but it's okay now. And my daughter said, not okay, you know, you gotta stay. So my, my point is, is that all those things are, are, are part of the book. Um, and I guess the last challenge I want to make to you, Gordon, and to all of us, is that when you read Karen Steiner, she argues that uh, authoritarian values and liberal values are almost an exact opposite. Uh, authoritarian values are about obedience, they're about obeying the law, and they are, she has three, and the last one is sanctity, which is cleanliness. Um, and, um, and they don't believe in equality, they don't believe in equality, they believe in social dominance. Um, and so a lot of the things that we think people organize around, uh, they don't, and up until 10 years ago, we'd say only 15% of the population uh, identify, consciously identify with the, the social dominance. 85% of the population identify with some form of equality. That number has shifted now. They're now 30%, a 
almost all white, now believe in social dominance. So they believe that whites are supposed to dominate. Uh, and so I guess one question is, how do we actually, and the number's probably growing, and like you suggest in terms of priming, we're going to shift that. But how do we talk to people who start off by believing, I have a right to dominate women, I have a right to dominate gays, I have a right to dominate blacks, I have a right to dominate. Um, and the question of connection, the interconnection is fine. It's like as long as one white person to another white person, okay, we can connect. But I don't want to connect with immigrants. I don't want to connect with gays. I don't want to, and I'm willing to connect with women but only if they're in a subservient role. Uh, how, how do you think about, I mean, do we just write those people off? Because 30% uh, is a lot, um, and, and they're well organized. So, turn it back. Yeah, I, I, um, I've been reading a little bit about the um, Soviet Union post, um, Russia post Soviet Union collapse, and, and there's a lot of um, polling of the rise of authoritarian thinking over time. So clearly, it's something that's being done to us and that we're fighting against. Um, and, and I believe, I, mean, I believe we can overcome implicit bias and authoritarian thinking through relational work, but can we do it at scale is a question. The, um, Joseph McKellar and um, Ben McBride, who lead um, PICO's work in California, have been traveling around the state. They just became the co-directors, and they've been traveling around the state talking to grassroots leaders. And the question they've been asking people is, well, if you put aside what we should do, what do we want to become? And what do we want to be? And, and I think that's in the spirit of, um, sometimes we don't ask the right questions about, um, and I think our, our, uh, the left and progressive movement and people starting for social justice um, probably are spending too much time asking the question of, well, what's the right strategy? What's the issue we should work on? And we're not actually creating a movement that um, people can say, no, I want to be part of this because it's meaningful to my life and um, I can see myself in it. I, I've, had the, I've been in California now probably nine times over the last two years and I've um, spent almost all my time in the Central Valley. So I've been in Fresno and Merced and Bakersfield um, and we've had, um, PICO's had five organizations in the Central Valley um, for the past probably, I don't know, John, 20 years or so. John probably you probably created them at some level. Um, in Stockton, Modesto, Fresno, and they're great organizations. So the Fresno group has been in this tremendous fight over creating a housing policy in the city of Fresno. So really like, like good fights at a city level, but when you look at the Central Valley and how it's organized, the ag industry, realtors, transportation, the people who have the institutions that run the valley, and then, you know, as you're saying, there's, you know, behind that a set of forces of capital that are financing, um, are all organized at a regional level. And the challenge has been for human beings who've been invested in their local organizations, how do you create something that has a regional vision, that has regional power, that can, that the Air Quality Board basically runs the Central Valley at some level, or through the Air Quality Board, economic forces run the Central Valley, um, how do you, and it's really, it's the opposite, it should be called a bad quality, a bad air, um, because it's all organized to basically facilitate pollution. How do you organize it to regional level? And we've been through this big process of, we actually, the, the, all five organizations decided to merge into one Faith in the Valley organization and then create chapters. So you talk about death. Organization, what I've learned from organizing is that a lot of times an organization has to die for something to, new to be built up, and it's very hard. It's why we're full of organizations that have lost their way in their mission because it's almost impossible to kill an organization. In fact, I think sometimes the less effective it is, the more likely it is to succeed. <laughs> so, um, but we've been through this interesting process of developing a regional vision for the Central Valley and a vision of what it would mean to be um, one valley and, and, um, and create, and, and essentially what people have said is that the, the, the biggest narrative question is, um, can something be different? Is it possible for the Central Valley to be different or does it have to be this way? And you know, and then there's a the question: you know, is, is it is it the air quality? Is it um, 
getting control of the county governments because that's really where the power is. So there's a lot of practical questions, but it's been amazing to me the willingness of people from Bakersfield to drive all the way up to Stockton every like two months or so for a region-wide meeting. And, and that the Central Valley has, a, has an identity. So I think that question, so as an organizer, you know, it's, it's easy to go to the theoretical questions, but kind of practically, how do you do that? How do you create an identity that's a new identity that has a political significance? Because if people don't feel like they're living in the Central Valley, but the forces that are operating and reshaping their environment are operating at that level. So it's, it's such an asymmetrical, um, question and um, I, yeah, I, I think a lot about is organizing enough I don't think I think it's an element and I think we need to do it better um, but we're, we need to operate at so many different levels so uh, that's that's it but I appreciate the challenges I think it's um, super well, helpful I'm gonna open a question for questions and, and as I do so I want to acknowledge uh, Olivia who's uh, who does our California work around narrative and we just did a survey and I don't know if is it open to the public now um, we can be if you reach out to me. I, we have okay. to share the results. So, so it looks at the Central Valley is looking at this who Californians think they are and what's the divide. And one of the things they found in the survey, if I'm not mistaken, is that the uh, economic divide was much smaller than the racial and immigration divide, uh, which also tells us where we need to do work, uh, what's actually separating people, which is one other uh, footnote. We did a study that the state adopted for housing. Uh, statewide, and we uh, and Weiner actually has a bill in the Senate now to build more affordable housing and mixed uh, income housing along trans transit stops, and not to let cities and counties override that rule. And the progressive mayor of Berkeley said this this proposed bill was war. Uh, and the point that I'm making, uh, Gordon, is that he was saying cities have a right to control their own destiny. You know, so this sort of fragmentation. So every city should have the right to say, not in my city. So where do you build housing? You know, and, and, he's, and he's coming off as this progressive mayor. It's like, we're gonna fight this to the death. It's like, really? Uh, and just in the Bay Area, and those of you who live in the Bay Area, most of you probably do, in the last two years, I think the last two years, the Bay Area has created almost 500,000 jobs. And we built 50,000 units of housing. So the growth of the area and the people coming in, coming in with more money than the people already here. The dynamics is that that's gonna keep driving up the cost of housing. And then you have this progressive mayor saying, the city has to control its own city as opposed to this is a state problem, this is a regional problem. Um, you know, I live in, you know, anyway. So let me open it up for your questions and comments uh, now. And tell us who you are. Uh, Jeff, uh, Black Robes Matter. Um, uh, Bill Moyer doing democracy? I didn't see, oh, you never heard of it. No, Bill Moyer, I mean, I think both, all of us, um, or I will speak for John, but um, the tradition of, um, of democracy, it's, it's so, influ so the tradition of democracy, I, I know the court system's important, um, the, is, it, I, I feel like what we're trying to do is re, capture democracy, and some of that is in the life of organizations, so people have the experience. So my of, question is yeah. about uh, chapter four, it's about uh, activist self-sabotage, and uh, I've just never seen anything so spot on, and uh, unless you've seen uh, Monty Python, uh, Black Brian, but um, I mean, it's so spot on, and what happens in self-sabotage, and I'm wondering, I don't think I saw that in your book, and do you think it's relevant, or do, do well, just, you know what just, just a little bit of context for those people who haven't seen it. What's, what's in it that, you, that you're asking? Because a lot of people haven't seen it, so they want to understand the question. Self-sabotage? Yeah, what, oh, what do you mean what, by What do I mean self-sabotage? No, we know it's self-sabotage, but what's an example? What do you, what do you make so a reference to? So what I mean to? by self-sabotage is um, everybody is, is so certain that the number that we live in a soon happy society and the number of lawsuits is climbing, but the number of filing fees is down so dramatically that all the California law libraries funded by them are going bankrupt. It's down like forty percent in six years. And why is you know so so um, why is nobody in the activist community? They're just they're just completely as the hot coffee movie documents. 
they're, they're misinformed, they're, they're stigmatized. They, it's worse than misinformed because they believe one plus one. We had a chance to talk beforehand, and, and I think um, so just to share with other people, right? So the, the question that we, we at least talked about before is, are we um, using the court system to adequately to advance justice or people discounting what can be accomplished with the court system? And as a, as a lawyer turned community organizer, I think it's a fair um, question. I, I mean, I, I, we, we need a multi, we need a mixed media strategy to social change. And I would say from um, our, our field, we probably under um, estimated the ability to use the legal system to accomplish goals, but I think in part because um, the, the, as, as a former legal service lawyer, I think that, that set of institutions, whether it's law schools or um, legal, legal service or civil rights organizations, haven't always been sort of prepared to partner. So that, I think there's a question there about how we, we do a better job partnering between advocacy groups, legal groups, organizing groups. Um, not everybody coming from law schools has such an embedded relationship with the organizing movement. <laughs> Other, yeah. I just wanted to comment on that. Uh, one of the organizations that tell us who you are. Think of. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Lisa Perlman. I'm a retired judge. But the League of Women Voters just had a huge success in Pennsylvania, and in Kansas, what they're doing is they're partnering with the prison system when parolees are getting out and a educating them about their right to vote and how they uh, implement it. So they're doing things that you might not associate with the league but they're open to partnerships. In Florida, we're partnering, um, Faith in Florida, our Florida organization, uh, um, the, the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, which is led by formerly incarcerated and returning citizens, partnering with League of Women Voters, ACLU, other groups, they have now put on the ballot in 2018 a constitutional amendment that would re-enfranchise somewhere north of 1.5 million Florida residents who are prohibited from voting. One out of 10 people in Florida can't vote because they have a former, uh, they have a criminal record. Um, one in four African Americans. Um, it, tremendous, it, it, it's interesting because it, John's done some consulting on it, that it, you ha we have to persuade 60% of Florida voters to re-enfranchise 1.5 million people. And um, the polling and the focus groups are fascinating and I think they point to kind of what the path forward is. So um, the original kind of messaging and framework for the campaign was about voting rights and about democracy. So it was actually incorporated as Floridians for a Fair Democracy. And then we went out and we talked to people with the eye towards you have to persuade 60% of people who vote to say yes on this amendment. And what became really clear was that you could not get to 60% of a vote if it was a conversation about politics. You were just gonna be 50-50. But if you talked about second chances, redemption, you get to 65, 70%. You even so get Trump. You even get Trump, right. So and, and Trump's talking about it. So and, and then you, I think you do start to tap into these, the business side of the sort of, well, we might end up going to jail ourselves and these regulations are too strict. So I, I always feel like that these guys who are about, these governors who are about to go to jail suddenly become very firm against the death penalty. They have this sort of last minute conversion um, about criminal justice reform. And we know the Koch brothers are, you know, a big financer of um, the, you know, ending mass incarceration because they have a set of agendas around decriminalizing corporate um, activity. So. But it's an interesting sort of like, how, like, I think what that points to is both the structural questions of we have to fight for democracy. And I would say to people inside of our organized meeting, that if, organization that if you're at a meeting that you've got to ask three questions if you're doing strategy. One, like, what are we doing that would deliver real benefit to the people that are in the room and that are our base? So we can't lose touch with like, what do people need? Two, how are we changing the rules to make it easier to fight the next fight? So are we going to same day registration for voter registration? Are we re-enfranchising um, formerly incarcerated? Are we opening up more voting sites? All the things that make the democracy work. And then three, what's the story we're telling that Olivia is helping us with in California? How are we telling a story that people want to be part of? And it's easy, I think, and we're built in so many issue silos to not do the second two. So we'll take two, two questions. 
Uh, well, I see three hands, so I'll let you three ask questions, but I ask uh, Gordon to wait until all questions are out. Okay. Yeah. Then he'll answer those questions and make closing comments, and then we'll let you go. And uh, if you need to leave before then, that's fine. So I see, I saw one, two, three. Oh, okay. She's letting me go first. I'm Adina. I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Berkeley, Albi, Emeryville. And um, something that I really struggle with when I've done organizing and as I do organizing is, uh, what is what is my issue? What am I allowed to work on in some ways? It, in the League, it's kind of easy because, you know, for registration, democracy, like, that's very broad. I think that affects everyone. But something I struggle with as an individual is kind of saying, I want to be part of this issue, I think it's really important, but it doesn't affect me, and I want to support, but also not be in a space that, you know, um, it's not my area of expertise, and um, put myself into um, a, a space that might not want me. And besides the obvious of asking and seeing how you can support, you know, do you have any thoughts on that? That's my question. Nice question. Was it me? Yeah, I think it's yeah. you. So, another League of Women Voters person here, and uh, one of the things that I'm concerned about is leagues, uh, the way we express things is very abstract in general. We don't tell stories. And that makes us ha it hard for us to connect with people because it's uh, too uh, school bookish. It's too, yeah. uh, and that, and plus the fact that we're not sufficiently racially diverse, a lot of our leagues, it varies. But um, so we p try and partner with more diverse organizations, including BOCA right here in Berkeley. Um, but it's a real uh, dilemma for us when we want to really change the league from you know white su white suffragists from actually 1911 in California uh, to a much broader palette of all of us. Yes. Hello, I'm Dax Vivid, and um, I'm interested in that question of scalability mm -hmm. and the your thoughts on new media or social media and the internet as a, if that's even a useful tool or if really in person is the way to go. Yeah, so in some ways they are all connected questions really. Um, I don't want to generalize, but and I, I've been doing a lot of radio interviews as part of um, this book tour, promoting the book. And I, I think there is a challenge on the left of being too issue focused, too lecturing, too much talking at people and not with people. So I think we need, if we're given the stakes, we, we need to build organizations differently. So the racial consciousness and just building it in, um, and the sort of being able to show up in places and listen and proximity and um, so I feel like we are all obligated to build better organizations that are more humane and that just like the simple thing, and I, this is the first book event that I've done where I haven't spent the first 10 minutes with this asking people to turn to each other and share their story. And I really, so I, I, and I, I feel bad about that right now. So, um, but I really think like simple things that sort of shift the, um, the emotional state of the room and the world I think we have to, I really am a big, increasingly a believer in like our capacity to create a different emotional environment with our own being and our willingness to ask questions um, and, and take risks. So I just, I think the risk taking, like we are not taking big enough interpersonal risks across difference um, because we're much more connected. So I, I think that's, I think we can, you, I love Facebook. It just helps me connect to people that are so far away that are important to me. So I, I, I think it's more the content. I feel like it's more the content than the methods. Um, and that we can create different kinds of more humane content. So I, I just think, like, I guess my, uh, I'll talk a second about the book, but I think one, like, if there's, like, over the next couple weeks, a meeting you can go to that you haven't been to, or if you're in something, is there something that you could do to either take on more responsibility or just create a more humane environment in the organization you're in? So I really am a believer in like small steps <laughs> and ripples, um, I would say. And then just on a really practical note, so basically um, Barrett Kohler, which is Oakland-based publisher, published the book in English. And then the California Endowment helps support 
the translation into Spanish, and that I self-published. They're both available in, well, the English book is mostly available, it's available in bookstores, less so the Spanish one. They're both available on Amazon, um, and then I'm selling them back in the back of the room with cash or credit cards for either the Spanish one or the English one. The Spanish one's $8 because it doesn't have a middleman, and the English one is $12, which is basically the cost. Um, and there's also an audio version and Audible, and there's a website, www.standupbook.org, because nothing can happen without a website. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate being here. So in closing, let me say two things. One, um, I thought about what you just said, Corinne, in terms of how to organize the room, which we didn't do, uh, partially we started late. So I'm gonna suggest that you leave after you buy the book. Uh, you either grab someone just on the way out and uh, what Gordon talks about in the book is about emotional connection. So um, see if you can emotionally connect with someone by telling them a little about yourself, what's important to you, but also listening. So just sit five minutes do that. Um, and then just uh, as a, by ending by saying, I really have felt really a great privilege to be part of uh, the uh, relationship with Pico uh, in general, but Gordon specifically. And Gordon talks about trust. And for me, uh, you know, there's a, I would say genuine caring and love for Gordon and, and his life struggle, but also tremendous trust. So even when we don't agree on everything, which we almost do, um, I really trust just the basic openness and, and integrity uh, that you bring to the table. Uh, so I want to thank you for sharing with us, and hopefully you can buy the book. I'm sorry I have to run. I have another appointment at 5.30, so I want to stick around. Uh, but thank you for coming, and thank Gordon. Thanks, John. Thank you.